All right, welcome back. We hope you brought your lunch with you today. Um, I'm really excited to have folks from the Perlman Center here today. Sometimes when kids come to Cincinnati, uh, we'll sometimes do like a consultative visit or if they live in the area, uh, this is a great program. It's an interdisciplinary program that serves a lot of kids with medical and motor complexities. So I'm gonna let our speakers take it from here. Uh, good afternoon. I'm Melissa Talley, one of the physical therapists from the Perlman Center. And uh, my cohort is Libby Cronit, Willie Croner, and she's a speech therapist at the Perlman Center. And we're going to be talking um, with you today about uh, how assistive technology can help patients with charge. It really is a true show and tell, um, as there's a, a pretty vast array of uh, adaptive equipment out there. And um, we're going to just kind of highlight some of it today for the charge patients. Um, we really don't have any disclosures, disclosures other than um, there are a couple pictures of product and um, we do not receive any compensation from that. It's just used for clinical, clinical and education purposes. So assistive technology for children with charge syndrome. Um, Libby and I are gonna focus today on positioning and mobility equipment, that would be me, and augmentative and alternative communication, that's Libby. So these are two areas that we feel really can impact um, success for a patient with charge. So primary considerations of technology, um, these children present with hearing loss and vision loss and often struggle with balance problems that result in delayed development and communication. So assistive technology equipment, while a lot of times the patients will walk independently, um, they do present with delayed development and motor skills. They present with low tone and decreased endurance. They have postural control impairments and are at risk for spine or other um, um, uh, orthopedic issues or, or asymmetries. They struggle with feeding and swallowing and they have vestibular and sensory impairment. And there is positioning and mobility equipment that can really assist and augment their development um, and help them to be successful. For the augmentative alternative communication, AAC, um, for charge, we want to take a total communication approach. Uh, we want to help access, help them access their environment, um, improve and, and allow for um, social interaction and engagement with others. And we want to support continued language and cognitive development, as well as give them an ability to communicate their sensory needs and other wants and needs. As a physical therapist and occupational therapist, um, we will approach uh, adaptive positioning and mobility for 24 hour positioning concept. So what that really means is any positioning that we would um, be in throughout the day is what we want to address and make sure that there is support um, for proper stability and um, access. Of course, developmental positioning looks at postural control and strengthening, but we wanna make sure that these tasks are very specific and embedded into daily routine and not just on the side therapy. We wanna make sure that it really is engaging um, and motivating in daily and daily routines with the families. We wanna focus on upright positioning. Um, this really is a key target area for a patient with charge because we wanna make sure that they are able to play, be safe with feeding, um, have safe and functional access for bathing and sleeping, look at computer access and AAC communication um, integrated technology. But we also wanna to need to take into consideration the visual, sensory, and uh, participation um, needs of the children. We also take a total mobility approach. There's a lot of research that supports early mobility as well as early postural weight bearing to help um, with the developmental sequence and overall hip integrity um, for a long term. So primarily for charge, this could involve um, a gait trainer, stander, and may consist of a wheelchair as well, depending on um, how mobility develops. For transfers and, tra um, and transportation, we wanna make sure that there is a safe um, adapted means for car, riding in, safely in a car with a, uh, a commercial car seat or adapted car, sheets, car seats. And if they need to ride in a wheelchair, that there is um, education and opportunity for tie downs. So the Perlman Center defines functional positioning as that which promotes active movement and participation and provides an opportunity to positively impact cognitive function while decreasing the effects of abnormal tone and delays. Now, the type of equipment that we are talking about really is, um, it's termed complex rehab technology. Just to give you an aside, uh, the other term is durable medical equipment, DME. 
DME is more along the lines of, I have a hip replacement, I need an elevated raised toilet seat for six to eight weeks for recovery, it's something that I will use for an interim and possibly not for a long term, or my grandmother needs to have an adapted wheelchair or a walker for her mobility as she's aging. The complex rehab technology is medically necessary equipment that is individually configured to meet a patient's medical and functional needs due to a chronic condition or disability. In order for funding authorization to be effective, it requires a physician, a PT or OT, an ATP credentialed supplier or equipment vendor, along with the client and family to be an integral part of the process for trials, discussions, and ultimately the um, end recommendation. The equipment evaluation is very standard as well. And again, these are requirements that are put out by um, the RESNA guidelines, but they are also factors that are considered for authorization funding. If you're missing a component of this, the funding process may not be successful. Again, there is that assessment by the therapist and ATP credentialed vendor. This includes discussion and trials. Um, sadly, there are still some families that are um, recommended and selected products out of a book and not trialing, and that is really um, frowned upon and often leads to abandonment of the equipment. Documentation is completed and signed by the evaluating therapist as well as the referring physician, and it's accompanied by a quote from the vendor. All of this gets sent off to the insurance for authorization. Typically, this process can take six to 12 months before it is ready for delivery. It is a long time for the process, but there's fluctuation at times. Currently, right now in our tri-state area, it's actually six to nine months. A final fitting of the product is typically performed with the vendor and the therapist um, to allow successful education, um, setting up of the equipment properly for the function and safety of use, um, and ultimately leading to good compliance and use of the equipment. And then there's follow-up as needed for growth or any other needs. When we're looking at seating and positioning for access or really any functional play, postural support is very key um, to being consistent and reliable. This kind of fits along with that just right moment and task that um, was discussed in the last presentation. And the balance is needed for stability, um, for st stable support, but we also need to make sure we're allowing for dynamic positioning. Our patients with chards, often with the sensory and vestibular impairments, sometimes rely on movement in order to be successful. So movement is important um, for that sensory processing as well as visual processing and just overall engagement. So we need to think about the tasks that we're performing. If we are expecting some increased motor demand and really um, a lot of movement and that's the goal of the activity, we wanna make sure some, at times that we're decreasing the cognitive and visual demand. Sometimes the multitask um, uh, activity can really just make them to be unsuccessful um, and often lead to them um, having increased sensory or, or vestibular problems. If we want to um, really focus on the cognitive demand and actually the visual demand too, if you're really working on visual learning, you need to make sure that you're decreasing that motor demand. If you're really focusing on the cognition, you also wanna make sure that, that those visual strategies are in place to decrease the stress that they have visually so that they are able to really engage and perform at a cognitive um, level. So seating and positioning for access. Again, these patients often move independently. However, due to the other um, impairments that they show with postural control, balance, vestibular, and vision, the equipment can really be utilized to help them be more successful. Um, we oftentimes have patients come to us for computer access evaluation, walking independently. Um, when, when we go through our assessment, we find that they're really struggling just with the reach of upper extremity um, because their, their strength is decreased or just they cannot balance themselves appropriately in a uh, standard chair. And when we provide additional um, lateral supports, trunk supports and pelvic stability, they have much more success. So visual processing, we need to consider what is their visual field? What level of complexity can they understand? What's the distance that they're able to view? And it, do they need additional visual guidance for their reach? Is the client able to see the device, the toy, the activity, the people that they're looking to interact with? Range of motion, what is the location of the device or the activity? Um, does it need to be put up in a specific way for that they can actually see it or reach it? Balance and stability, do they have adequate support to be an active participant? Do they need a little bit of external support just to be more successful and controlled? And can they interact? Can they play? Can they activate the device? Can they reach for the picture symbol? Um, can they engage um, with their peers? 
So additional visual considerations for access. Um, we tend to see a lot of people with cortical visual impairment, which I understand is not, not what we're talking about with charge, but a lot of the visual considerations apply with this patient population as well. So oftentimes you can consider color. Um, is there a consistent background choice? Do you need to highlight certain features? Movement. Our charge patients like to move a lot. So if they're moving, can they see something better? And if they need to be more stable, does the object itself actually need to move or some light need to be on it to allow it to be, appear that it's moving? The visual field. Again, consider the placement and the background. Nothing too noisy um, to help them really pick out what they're looking at. Complexity, the same thing with this, is if um, what's the amount of vocabulary or the amount of pictures that you're providing? What's the complex level of the vision set, the symbol set that you're using or the object? And light gazing. Oftentimes we have patients that actually get struck by the light and they actually get stuck and they cannot get away from the light. So considering the positioning of which um, the device or the equipment or the toy is put for them or even putting a hat on to kind of help block the visual glare helps them to attend a little bit more. Now I'm going to go into just some samples of adaptive equipment. Again, this is the only slide in which I actually name a product, fireflyfriends.com. They have a lot of what I call commercially adaptive products for early intervention and actually up into uh, childhood ages. The play pack is an excellent tool for early intervention for different floor positioning and postural support and stability when someone's really trying to learn their developmental sequence and engage in their environment. The go-to seat is an excellent tool. It can go in shopping carts. It can be strapped to the back, uh, onto a chair, into a wagon. It's an excellent resource um, for providing just some external stability, and it's, they're a very low-cost item. The scoot is, um, you could use it as a little bit of a wheeled mobility. They can sit in it. They can lay on it and kind of do the swimming motion to kind of get around. There's a lot of developmental adaptive mobility that they can explore and ex um, experience with the scoot. The UPSI is a harness system that goes on the child and then also straps to the caregiver's waist, and you can help to train early mobility and stepping and balance. And then the splashy is a bath seat, which actually can also be used uh, as a floor sitter as well. Um, and the splashy is the product that they just made a second size from, the splashy big, because it is very useful um, for our patients. All of these products are pretty much under um, $500 to $700, you order direct from online. And again, it's just an excellent resource for um, families. As far as mobility, again, a lot of our patients are walking and mobile. However, research is showing that early uh, mobility and early standing is critical to development of the hips as well as just the ability to have a patient be able to explore their environment. Um, that's how they learn. That's how they, they engage with others. That's how they really interact with their environment. So the utilization of a gait trainer, either a posterior walker, forward walker, or a gait trainer to allow them to be hands-free to really get in and engage and explore their environment, especially with their visual and vestibular needs, might be something that really could be appropriate and augment independent gait for them for the future. The standards, um, if they have any hip instability whatsoever, doing static standing 60 to 90 minutes a day is critical for this hip development, and research is showing this. If you're really struggling with a mobile person um, as they're getting older and vestibular sensory behavior, you may need to rely on an adaptive stroller for those long distance um, mobility settings or for times when they just need to be in a safe position and not uh, in um, a risk for elopement or injury. So you could consider an adaptive stroller as well as there's the uh, manual wheelchairs lightweight for propulsion as well as the tilt and space style, right? It's their dependent push. Again, not everyone's gonna use them, but it's important to know that these resources can definitely help. The other side of the equipment that I really wanna talk about today is positioning for safety. Um, transit in a vehicle, everyone needs to have a car seat or a seat belt utilized, and sometimes due to some of the postural control, vestibular, sensory, or maybe behavioral um, needs, the commercial seats are not appropriate or safe. They are Houdinis and they're able to get out, so there are some commercial safety guards that are available. And then if they're too big for the adaptive equipment or for com commercial equipment or the booster, there are adapted resources available. I only have pictures of two of the seats here and two of the harnesses that we recommend. Um, but there are several others. And the Perlman Center, along with the trauma services team at Cincinnati Children's Hospital, team together to address this need. And I will tell you that um, there is a great need for this, and we have had a large increase of referrals, which tells us that there are a lot of people riding not so safe in our communities, and we are definitely here to help. Um, the products are able to go through insurance, 
Some of them are more costly. Um, the harness systems tend to be less than four or $500, could be purchased out of pocket, but could go through funding as well. If you have any questions with that, you could call 803-RIDE, and that'll get you connected to the trauma department, and they will help you with the processes of getting through Perlman for some assessments. The other part of safety is sleeping. Um, I think our charge patients have a hard time sleeping it, um, which let, means the family has a hard time sleeping. Sometimes there's additional safety concerns as well and risk for elopement or getting up and wandering at night. And there are some really nice resources available that are able to be funded by insurance just to kind of help or provide help and provide a safe environment for sleeping. Uh, the bottom right one is more for more medical postural positioning needs um, and more dependent care, whereas the top two might just offer a safe environment for someone who's more independent. Um, it also can serve as a nice safety sensory shelter. So it doesn't only have to be used for sleep, but could also be utilized for um, daytime sensory rest periods to help the patient modulate in their environment. And then we go into ADLs. Bathing, these are just three examples of different postural levels of support. Again, um, having fun and being safe in the bathtub and being able to um, provide daily hygiene care is really important, and uh, patients are slippery when wet. So sometimes having additional support allows for safety for the caregiver also if there's needed um, support with transits. And then support for access. So sometimes it's just as easy as providing an appropriate sized chair. This is just a toddler-sized chair, the red chair, which will keep the patient's feet on the floor allow them some stability base at their pelvis, um, and actively be able to reach at the child size table that they would be sitting at. But they may need more additional supports. So these two are examples of some moderate to then maximum assist, just depending on what their needs are. And I can tell you that this is missed a lot. So providing some seatbelt or some stability with laterals, um, giving that a try if someone's really struggling or seems to be more behaviorally not able to attend might really help this. All right, now we'll transition to Libby. Hello, I am Libby willig Kroner. I'm a speech language pathologist at the Perlman Center, and it's just my pleasure to be here today to talk with you about assistive technology and augmentative and alternative communication. So thank you so much, Missy, for going over that, uh, that seating and positioning and mobility assistive technology. Um, as Missy said, this equipment is uh, just so critical. There's a growing body of research uh, that shows that optimizing that early mobility is just critical to enhancing cognitive skills and the intellectual development of our children with disabilities and neuromotor conditions. So this is just so important for our little ones. Um, and also that brings us to the topic of communication. So uh, we are also going to be talking today about augmentative and alternative communication, or AAC. And uh, this first slide here is just uh, the definition of what is involved when you hear that term AAC, what does that mean? And of course, augmentative is the, um, the process of augmenting or helping speech abilities, and alternative is defined as the process of uh, providing a substitute for speech. So that's kind of a, a more formal definition um, to summarize. Um, it's basically the use of any additional strategies um, that you can provide to help support communication. So uh, we like to take a total communication approach. Um, AAC is total communication, and uh, that can include gestures, facial expressions, eye movements, postures, manual signs, the picture exchange communication system, or PECS, which many of you have probably heard of, um, communication boards that are adapted, can also include simple voice output devices or electronic speech devices. So um, we'll go into and kind of delve into some of the examples of augmentative and alternative communication that might be uh, good options for some of your children, and you might be able to hopefully take today uh, away some knowledge with you about um, some supports that might be able to help you with your child. So um, many parents ask when, when they're first learning about AAC, um, you know, if I provide my child with an alternative way to communicate, will that enable them or will that interfere with their motivation to produce verbal speech? Um, and that's a topic that 
has been widely explored, thankfully, um, in the field of AAC, and, and we've actually been shown the contrary through the literature that by providing AAC, we're actually able to give our children a really strong foundation in their language skills and um, teaching them the vocabulary and the communication skills that they need to succeed and to continue to grow and develop. So uh, what we find is that AAC, when we introduce AAC as part of our total communication approach, that, that often actually encourages that verbal communication as a result. And sometimes we even see additional verbal uh, communication when we begin to introduce AAC supports. So uh, we'll, again, we'll just kind of delve into some examples of AAC and um, have some examples to show you some here today. So American Sign Language is, uh, sign language is, is one form um, of communication that can be used to augment or support our communication as, as sometimes a really easy way for parents and families to begin to show their child alternate ways to begin to communicate. Um, signing time, I know I have a lot of parents come in and say, oh, my child just loved these signing time videos and they were able to learn a lot of signs. Um, so we've had a lot of parents tell me that they've enjoyed that. Um, it can help facilitate that language development. How can It can also help reduce a lot of frustration that we see um, in children early on so that they can have some really basic and immediate needs met. Um, as as uh, children get into more advanced communication, sometimes the fact that it's not completely universal can, can um, be a barrier to uh, more advanced communication. And also they have to have the fine motor skills to be able to participate in, in more advanced sign language. So. Um, so we also have an example of small object and pi picture communication. And uh, the picture exchange communication system, or PECS, is a communication system with phases um, in which the child begins by discriminating um, the picture. Some of you may have heard of this before, but, th but the uh, child exchanges the, the picture to receive an item. And some of these systems uh, are modified um, and picture uh, symbols can be used or modified so that they are uh, adapted for differences in fine motor skills, differences in visual skills, and even just cognitive understanding of the representation of that item in a picture. So um, I'm not sure if any of you had the pleasure of listening to um, Sean Herrick's presentation uh, in which she talked about some of these things and how she's implemented them with her own son, um, but I would encourage you to do that. She had some beautiful implementation of picture schedules, um, and um, you might hear people talk about picture schedules as a way to uh, help children understand what's coming next. Um, so those are all wonderful supports that we can introduce. Uh, sometimes we will introduce um, objects to begin, small objects for communication, if visual skills are uh, an issue or um, also to help bridge the cognitive understanding of the representation of an item like a small school bus to sing wheels on the bus. So some examples um, moving along um, of small object and picture communication. Um, the STACS is a standardized tactile um, augmentative communication symbols kit. And you can purchase this kit. It has small objects um, that can be used. So a bowl, for example, might be used to represent food or more to eat. And so the child can feel and touch that. And also it is three dimensional. So it's highly supportive of low vision and it can be very concrete as far as the understanding goes um, for supporting that early communication and can kind of help bridge that, uh, that transition to understanding picture communication and that exchange um, of something. The pod communication books um, are sometimes used in what we call partner assisted scanning. And the pod system is actually where you can, the communication partner or the parent or clinician or teacher or uh, care provider could scan through communication words or choices. 
and the child gives a positive response to indicate that that's the, the word or the phrase that they are intending to say. So I do have an example of a pod system here um, where the child might select draw and then the, the care provider, the communication partner would then flip to the draw page and then scan through the choices for drawing that they might have. So would you like to do more drawing? Do you need paper? You might get down to colors and allow for a color choice. And so these are presented in the same way every time. So that can be another system that's available for communication. Um, another thing that we sometimes use are low-tech voice output devices. And these devices are have nice big targets and they can assist us in providing a way for early communication and interaction skills. So uh, can you participate in a Wheels in the Bus song? Um, can you, uh, you know, wait for the pause and then continue the song with one of these buttons or devices. And so um, those are have recorded messages on them and you can sequence a whole song for a button press um, or you can have a single message on them as well. So those are some examples of a low tech voice output device that you could potentially use with your child. Next, we will have um, a static display speech generating devices. And a static display speech generating device is basically a device that's used to help introduce early language within a single context or a single activity at a time. Um, and so there are some advantages sometimes to just having a single page. It's uh, a, a bit easier to learn um, and we can introduce uh, a communication interaction within just a single activity. And that can be very, um, very rewarding and successful for the child. So for example, we have this one here and um, you could press, you could have a mealtime experience for, you another know, bite, please. you say another bite, please. Um, I'm all done. I want something else to eat. I'd like something to drink. So um, that's an example of what's called a static display speech generating device. And there are a lot of these devices on the market. Here are some examples that you might see. Um, and they have different features depending on what skills you, it is that uh, the child needs. So for example, the buttons might be bigger or smaller depending on those fine motor skills that the child has, also depending on their language level and how many uh, buttons or vocabulary words can they have on a single overlay at, at one time. So those can all be explored um, during speech and language therapy um, to determine a good level for your child. And um, some of those, if they have a single page, some of those will have a multiple level feature where you can uh, save one page and then switch levels and it has another saved page ready to go. So you could have say 10, um, 10 different activities that you have saved on that device um, at any given time. Here are some additional examples of some speech generating devices with some more sensory support. So um, when you're considering hearing, uh, maybe a hearing impairment or visual impairment, uh, there are some of these devices that allow for additional sensory support. So backlighting when you press the, the button of, this, of the speech device can be helpful. Um, something that allows for um, additional auditory features, or um, the, the one on the left here, the prox talker allows for the system to um, be like a PEC system, but it also provides additional auditory input. So that's yet another option. So uh, we, I kind of took a little survey um, from some parents um, and, and social media and got some permission to share some of their commentary about um, what they're saying about their own children using charge or, 
their own children with charge and using low-tech augmentative communication. And um, here's some quotes for some of the feedback that we got from families. Um, so for, we have one family. For us, it's been a long journey. Our, our daughter has always loved the picture communication and packs. Um, We've used low tech communication, a low tech communication system such as co drawn symbols and stories pa paired with sign language. Um, early on, a concrete schedule or calendar was phenomenally helpful. And this method uses small replicas of real objects uh, like the ones we showed you earlier, such as a tiny book to represent a book, a book or reading. And then this last quote at the bottom I think many of your our kids show us clearly when a method or approach fits with them. It also seems that one technique to bridge to another, such as pecs bridging to a device or signing bridging to talking, et cetera, happens naturally. So I love that quote because what that uh, shows us is that total communication approach, again, can be so helpful. So, um, you know, you're, if you are using one of these systems, it is just one piece of the larger puzzle for your for communicating with your child. And it's quite possible um, and likely that that you will be using multiple uh, of these methods as you communicate, even if even in the scenario that your child might also be utilizing a higher technology communication device as well. So um, I think that's a wonderful illustration of that. You know, the, the first then schedule might come in very handy for your child for transitions, for example, um, or an object uh, schedule might also be handy for transitions. So sometimes it takes a little exploration and trial and error to determine what is going to help your child succeed uh, best and taking those supports and implementing them. So that brings us on to dynamic display speech generating devices. And all the that means is a dynamic display, of course, is a changing display. So uh, when you hear that term, that's referring to a computerized device um, that has changing displays and screens for vocabulary. It's a more robust language system, and it offers more complex communication language opportunities. So uh, you might consider this type of device for Build, putting words together, um, building longer sentences for communication. And, um, and if your child is reaching a level where their vocabulary is becoming quite robust and you're running out of spots in your PECS book maybe um, to put some of those photos um, or put some of those pictures, and you might find yourself considering, well, maybe it's time that we implement a, um, a computerized high-tech device. So here are some examples of a dynamic display um, speech generating device. And um, what happens when we consider the dynamic display speech gener generating devices, there are a lot of different language programs and devices on the market. So these are just a few examples. Several different companies um, produce them, and there are also different types of language programs. So generally speaking, what happens if uh, your child, uh, you think your child might benefit from one of these types of devices, they could come for an evaluation to trial these devices in within activities uh, in treatment to determine if they are a good fit, um, if the vocabulary level is appropriate, um, and so on and so forth. So here's another example of the dynamic display speech generating devices. And each of these devices on this, this slide and the previous slide offer alternative access um, methods for communication. So if you find yourself thinking, well, you know, I think my child understands quite a bit, um, but might have difficulty pressing the buttons on that communication device. There are several different alternative access methods um, that can be utilized to better access a, a device if fine motor 
um, if there is a fine motor impairment or fine motor skills aren't quite advanced enough to be selecting really small buttons on a speech device. So those can include um, switch scanning, which is actually where uh, a button a lot like this one is used to um, actually scan through choices by pressing the button and the buttons are highlighted then and then uh, another button is pressed to make a selection. So that process is called scanning. Um, another example of an alternative access method that can be utilized is a, a head mousing option where the patient um, or child has a a little dot on their head or a sensor, and they're, uh, they're able to use that to move the cursor across the screen to make a selection. Um, and we also have now um, to use high-tech eye gaze uh, access, which is an eye gaze camera that senses the movements of the eyes. Um, another support that we use quite a bit is a plastic key guard. And what a plastic key guard is, is I can show you an example here. It's just a guard that actually guides the fingers into, um, into the button so that if you have um, if you have your hand holding onto the screen, it will help um, prevent that from making a selection and you have to ha actually have your finger guided into the correct button to make that button press. So that is called a key guard. So there are several ways that um, you can utilize a communication device if you're requiring alternative access to that. Um, so some supports to consider when we talk about implementing this type of technology would definitely be visual impairment and hearing impairment. Um, so some supports that might benefit kids with visual impairment could include a visual highlight on a button press. So if the button turns red when you press the button to give that feedback. Um, there's also a haptic feedback uh, option on some of our communication devices, which is a vibration. Um, and actually even some of the, the iPad and Android devices now have that haptic feedback where you press a, a, a target on the screen and you get that vibration. So you feel that that button has been activated. Um, the key guard that I mentioned is another way to support that visual impairment. And um, that key card can be very useful as far as, um, as far as the, I'll show you here. Um, sometimes what we've done when there is low vision, we've actually used the key card as a guide. I'll pop this on here. We've used the key card as a guide to help kids locate the correct um, row and then count over to get to the correct word. So they might um, use these tactile supports here to find the correct placement and then the correct row, and then they might, tar they might move over to the correct target to find maybe drink. Drink. So, um, so that is a support um, that we have introduced. Um, backlighting can also be a support. So with some of the static display devices I showed you earlier, um, some of those ad having additional backlighting. Um, and then of course the backlighting of a computerized device is uh, something that can be supportive. Um, and then the small object support. So even when using a, a high technology device, we might still use small object supports um, in other areas. Ability to adjust the font size might be something you could explore. And then um, language problems with consistent button sequences um, for motor learning is another support that you might utilize um, to help a child with visual impairment. So for example, one of the language programs um, that uses what's called semantic compaction uses the same icon sequence every time to get to the word drink. And so that uh, child will learn that motor pattern to activate that word each time and those mo that uh, motor memory can help a child with that visual impairment. 
For hearing impairment, um, some of the adjustable auditory features can be very helpful, of course. Um, so making sure that the speaker is loud enough and is able to get loud enough, uh, which varies on devices. Um, a visual highlight, again, on the button press, that haptic feedback can also help us if we are hearing impaired. Um, and then text or icons that appear in the um, this speech display window can also be a nice reinforcer that the correct word or button was selected. Um, ASL symbols and symbol sets have also been something else if the child knows quite a bit of sign. Some of the um, communication devices out there actually have um, symbol sets that are used with, um, that have pictures for ASL sign. So those are all examples of supports that you might consider. Here are some common iPad communication apps, and um, you may, have, as parents, uh, if you've if you've gone down the road already of exploring some of these augmentative and alternative communication options, um, you may have heard about some of these communication apps before: uh, Proliquo to Go, Lamp, Touch Chat. Uh, those are all popular communication apps in addition to the other ones that you see here. And um, many families do come to us sometimes where they've already begun to introduce some of these, um, these apps with their child to see if it's something that they might benefit from. And if you were to, to look into some of these, you'll see that they vary quite a bit um, in price um, for instance, the sounding board is a free app that offers simple uh, picture choices, and whereas the um, some of the more pricey apps tend to be up to $300. So they vary quite a bit. Um, and if you're considering an iPad um, or implementing some communication on an iPad, you might consider working with the speech pathologist, um, working with your child as well um, to get their input as far as what features might benefit your kiddo and um, what what how many buttons do they show at one time will they need additional supports like one of those plastic key guards or um, the guided access feature or uh, to lock out access to other apps while they're communicating using a communication app um, or uh, menu lock options, other things like that. Um, but these are some, some common iPad communication apps that can be utilized um, on the iOS devices, and there are some of them can also be utilized on Android platforms as well. So there are many device companies out there. Um, these six are the ones that uh, tend to occur in our regional area here in Cincinnati um, and greater Cincinnati in the tri-state area. Um, so there are, you might hear about some of these different companies um, as you're exploring Ugcom for your child. Each different device um, and each different language program offers um, is slightly different. So there are different types of programs. Um, the, the first one on this slide is traditional orthography or spelling. So uh, that predictable app on the slide, for example, um, a couple slides previously is one where you actually spell out words and it has word prediction and phrase prediction features um, that can be used. So that would be obviously for someone with literacy skills, um, older kids who have developed literary skills, literacy skills. Uh, there are also semantic compaction programs. So these programs would include programs like MinSpeak, Unity, LAMP, um, and these types of programs use multiple meaning icons and those principles of motor learning to build consistent icon sequences to help children um, access their, their core words or their core vocabulary. Uh, and, and that just means the most frequently used words um, in, our, in our language. So um, they can participate in that. Uh, with some limited literacy, and it can also support some low vision um, due to the predictability um, of that icon sequence. 
There are also category-based language programs, so single meaning messages, um, and those often use grammatical encoding, meaning if the child were to press I want, it's going to predict what comes next. So um, it would have that word to pop up and it might have actions pop in and it might um, give a, a link to the items that the child might select um, that they want. So it uses a, a bit of prediction. Um, so some of those programs are considered uh, category-based language programs. So again, there are several different language programs out there. Um, and as you're working with your um, your child's speech language pathologist, um, you might identify that one type of program works better for your child and for you as the uh, care provider um, and the person communicating with that child um, because we, we do actually know and we have learned from working with children um, in augmentative communication that, um, that they learn when we speak using the device that we've identified for this, so, um, so we are able to teach them in that way um, by speaking uh, with them with the communication device. So. so here's some additional real commentary. What are parents of children with charge syndrome saying about high technology AAC? And uh, we have a couple comments here. Um, we use the NovaChat. I found that a lot of professionals underestimated my daughter's ability to use technology. She finally got a device at five and is a whiz. Um, so that that is um, this device here. Um, my daughter was navigating an iPad at 18 months. The speech device has really helped her at school to show them what she knows, hears, and understands. My daughter has a Nova chat. She turned four. She hasn't really picked up on using it much, like as I have seen with some other kids that are at her um, special needs preschool. And we also do ASL. Our daughter recently or currently signs and sometimes uses Perliquo to go. She sometimes uses Perliquo for text for longer expressive comments. And we like Perliquo to go as the message appears in print, which might be helpful to some who are deaf or hard of hearing and may not hear the voice output. So just a few comments there um, from families, different families with different experiences. Um, so that can kind of help demonstrate a bit um, that that there might be different features that would benefit your child um, depending on their specific needs. And it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. Um, we try to be very thoughtful when we are matching the features of the communication technology uh, to the needs of the child and really match that device to the child rather than trying to make our children fit to the devices um, that we have. So um, I think that really helps set them up for success and, and can really engage um, them in communication in a way that's more meaningful, hopefully, and powerful for you, um, you know, as parents and care providers um, in, in, um, enhancing their ability to communication, uh, ability to communicate at a higher level with you, um, because what we see then, of course, is a reduction in their frustration, um, hopefully, and hopefully, and in, in that will hopefully in turn then help uh, reduce behaviors that might be undesirable, and, um, and also just help us engage in greater social bonding and um, communication, um, positive communication experiences with our children. Um, so let's see, here are some additional augmentative and alternative communication resources for families that we have. And um, there, I, I believe that um, these are just a few, there are, there are many more out there. I do really enjoy, um, Pinterest, as many parents do, for finding wonderful ideas for what picture schedules have worked with, with uh, other children out there, um, what total communication supports can we implement um, that work realistically within our, 
communication environments. Um, you know, what seating and mobility did my child need to succeed um, in using um, this for greater communication? I love the Practical AAC blog. It's a, a favorite um, for getting some of those ideas and kind of hearing the buzz about um, children using augmentative communication. Um, and then there are some more academic um, resources listed on there as well that you could explore um, if you're looking for more information. So, Awesome. This has been great. I think um, I really appreciate thinking through early mobility and supporting kids to be included and, and communication. We have um, more questions about communication. I guess I wanted to highlight as well. Um, AAC without guidance is not such a great idea. <laughs> and also AAC that's supported across environments is really important. So um, I think my other charge caveat would be how I receive information and how I put it out. It may be different. I may need different things for both of those. So I think um, sometimes we have kids who are understanding uh, verbally but need to sign as an output. So if you don't have exposure to sign, you're not going to be able to express yourself. So I think that's things to think about. Uh, one of the questions, and I'll, I'll kind of take this and then we can pop it over, but there is a situation where a son uses ASL, but the school wants him to use AAC. However, he really hasn't taken to, to AAC. Um, he is the only deaf child uh, and and probably the only child with charge they have had, but they've tried this and he hasn't really wanted it. So why would we want to change the language of the way he communicates? And I'll, I'll take the first step in that you have a right to pick your own um, communication journey for your child. And so maybe an advocate through School for the Deaf or Deaf Blind Project can help educate that um, uh, school district. Um, I don't know if there's other thoughts you have from an from a speech language pathology perspective. Um, yeah, absolutely. I, I do think that question does come up quite a bit. Um, and you're right, you absolutely have the right to establish that uh, communication system for, for your child. Um, and that we know that sign can really help support those language skills and uh, certainly want that child to continue to have that support because it's going to support them from a cognitive um, development standpoint and language development standpoint. And I guess then uh, you might also consider, are there social implications in which the augmentative communication could help your child um, communicate with a greater population as well? So are there other uh, peers, for example, that your child's unable to communicate with using sign because they don't know sign? Um, and, you know, would that be a good uh, implementation of use of augment of different forms of augmentative communication, such as a speech device. Uh, so I don't, again, it's not a one size fits all right, approach. Right. And I think you find that uh, different supports work for different children, uh, but that, you know, there may be implement, there may be a uh, room for implementing both and, um, and I think that's something to consider. Yeah, and I think, too, I, I don't know what's fully embedded in this question, but it also makes me wonder if the school doesn't quite know mm -hmm. where the resources are to continue right. to support ASL. Mm -hmm. Again, that may just need, mean they need to broaden their um, te technical support from another location to kind of boost that up for an individual child in the district. But you do have every right to those decisions. And so... Um, I think deafblind projects and schools for the deaf, state schools for the deaf can sometimes really help push those conversations forward and also identify resources. The next question is, what would you recommend for a child that prefers to be verbal but has very unintelligible speech, only understood by parents and siblings? Wonderful. So that, again, comes to that AUGMENT um, piece of the AAC acronym. And I, this is an excellent, a speech device is an excellent way to support um, communication and use, um, use the device in order to use the device to actually just supplement the verbal communication. And uh, it, it is difficult to teach children. It takes a lot of practice to use a speech device as a 
clarification tool, but it is able to be done with a lot of practice and also with a lot of engagement and modeling from the, uh, the adults mm -hmm. who are helping to implement the communication system. So, you know, kind of modeling, oh, I think what you're saying is, you know, uh, bear. And so you go in and you find the word bear together. Um, so I, I think you can use that as a clarification tool um, when it's needed and allow the child to uh, rely on their verbal communication for when it is successful. So sometimes also we will have kiddos who you understand part of what they're saying, or maybe they're, they're familiar person like mom or or the teacher who's with them all the time really understands their communication, but nobody else does. And so that's a great time to be using that modeling to teach them how to say it in a different way so that you can practice that skill in a successful environment and so that they're able to build those skills for communicating with a broader range of communication partners. Mm -hmm. Some of what we've seen, too, um, with kids who are deaf and hard of hearing without charge, um, the AAC or an, a device that has the ability to kind of work and predict and build language actually improves comprehension, too, because what I think is happening is when we talk, the words are here and gone. When we sign, they're here and gone. But the visual allows kids to really take longer time to process organize. And so it's more than just speech. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's building language. And I think you hit that early, but I think so often people think about it as a speech device and not a language mm -hmm. support. So I think that's also uh, just a really good take home point. And processing speed, I think I've talked about this in, in a lot of other yeah. um, settings, is sometimes kids need wait time to produce. And then the other piece that's so common in charge is motivation. And if I'm not motivated, you're not going to get much. So finding those motivators for which to communicate about are really key. Uh, so Dr. I think, Wiley, these are, I think that, that plays into that, you know, all the research that we're hearing with the tasks, embedding it into task specific, yeah. embedding it into daily routines, because um, just therapy in general for kids is play. Right. So if we're pulling them aside and doing rote training or different specific things then and not embedding it into the play and the daily routines, it makes it harder for the child, but it also makes it harder for the caregiver too. If you embed right. everything into what you're doing, then you're practicing all day long. Yeah, no, that's a great point. And getting and more motor memory and Tons with charge in, in the charge literature and with people with good experiences, if it's not meaningful, it's yeah. going to be disconnected and not understood. So really that, yeah, find, figuring out where you're trying to communicate, where it's motivating, how you're going to bu build it in. Those are great. Um, those are great thoughts for families. So. Oh, absolutely. I think it's starting out with the most motivating things uh, should be definitely <laughs> the, everyone, the, huh? first step, the first step. <laughs> yeah, us, right? because that's going to build, build success and right. that's going to build on the strengths of the child too and engage them and, and, and uh, help reinforce those uh, interactions that they're participating right. in. So, so critical. No, I really appreciate you all um, coming and how the great information you have. I do also recognize sometimes families live in places that don't have a lot of resources. Um, and so where do you find those similar um, support networks? And, and I know you can't answer that, but <laughs> but reach out to us uh, mm -hmm. to see if we can find those connections. And we have actually had some families email us from either, oh, either connected from you or from another, um, especially I've, I've talked to a couple of families in charge who really needed a gate trainer and they lived rurally and had no idea. So right. I was able to communicate with the family and the therapist. Excellent. I think our speech therapists have too. So definitely. Yeah. We, no, we're I think resourced and by now any, with COVID anyway. and things we can do telehealth, yeah. <laughs> there's yeah. a lot, I think we finally opened our eyes a little bit. Yeah. Well, really Absolutely. appreciate all the support you give to kids and families. And that uh, um, if folks are coming into town, you've been really great at consultative stuff. If they live in the region, you're a great resource. And I always wish there were Perlman centers, other places, but <laughs> I'm often coming up empty. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Thank you. It's been such a pleasure yeah. to be here. Thank, thank you. you.